Hi everyone, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. You are greatly appreciated. Now I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this case before, but given the newest information about it, I figured it was time for me to discuss it. I didn't know too much about this case going in, and honestly I think the outcome is pretty insane. So whether this is new or old to you, I invite you to join me as we remember the lives of the Oklahoma Girl Scouts, Michelle, Denise, and Lori. The Girl Scouts of America is a youth organization for girls in the United States and was founded by Juliet Gordon Lowe in 1912. The Girl Scouts have always prided themselves on teaching young girls fundamental values in life through experience. As many may know, the Girl Scouts are well known for cookies, and typically the girls have a goal to sell as many cookies as they can in order to meet their goal to attend summer camp once a year. And that was no different for these three young girls in 1977. Michelle Heather Gousset, who was nine at the time, was a camp veteran. She had gone the year before and was excited for her next summer excursion. She would be spending two whole weeks away from her parents in the woods with friends. For Michelle, being outdoors was her happy place. She loved plants and tended to several of her own at home. In fact, she made her mother promise to care for her little plants as if they were her own. Michelle was very athletic and just loved to be active, so going to camp was a no-brainer. However, for 10-year-old Denise Milner, it was a completely different story. Denise was attending her first year of camp and it made her into a ball of emotions. She was a straight-A student and at the time had been accepted into Carver Middle in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a school designed for exceptional children. Some days she would be excited about her new experiences, but most often she felt nervous. She had never been away from her mother or younger sister Kathleen before. Denise only decided to try camp this year because her and a group of friends decided to go together. After working hard, boosting her cookie sales, and securing her spot, her friends backed out at the last minute and Denise was left to go alone. Days before she was expected to leave, Denise decided she no longer wanted to go out of fear. She didn't know if she would enjoy camp or even make friends, but with some push from her mother, she reluctantly hopped aboard the bus that fateful day. Lori Farmer was a little different from Denise and Michelle. Lori had options for summer and was torn between attending Girl Scout camp or the one hosted by the YMCA. She couldn't choose, so ultimately her mother Sherry decided for her. Lori was one of five children and was the youngest child at camp that year, being just eight at the time. She didn't mind being away from her family. She had done this before and loved the feeling of independence and making new friends. Unknown to the girls from Tulsa, camp would not be the same this year. Camp Scott had been in operation since 1928. Nestled inside of Mays County, about two miles from Locust Grove, the area was perfect for a summer camp. It was quiet and not a big booming city. Plus, the Tulsa Girl Scout headquarters was only 50 miles away. On June 12, 1977, several buses full of giggling, excited girls passed through the gates ready to begin their two weeks of independence and growth. The counselors were ready with an evening filled of fun activities to get the girls adjusted and to cure any homesickness that would arise. However, the forecast had other plans. Rather than s'mores around a campfire, the Girl Scouts were met with dark looming clouds, an omen of what was to come. After dinner, counselors rushed the girls out to their tents where they officially met their bunkmates. The tents were made to look like cabins. The frame and platforms were wooden, but the top was draped with a canopy with only a flap acting as the door. Each tent was equipped with four cots for each camper, no electricity and no real security from the woods. But this is the way it always was. The tents were arranged in a sort of semicircle, with number eight being the last. Number eight was part of the Kiowa unit, and the furthest from the counselor's tent, it was approximately 80 yards away. It was inside of tent number eight where Michelle, Denise, and Lori became quick friends in their short time together. While the rain poured outside, each of the girls wrote a letter home, documenting their arrival and feelings at the time before gathering around for story time. Denise had been upset. 
Camp was not turning out to be as fun as she thought, so she begged the counselor to let her call her mother to go home. The counselor was able to calm the young girl down and convince her to phone her mother in the morning and see if she still felt the same, and Denise obliged. As the night was winding down, a counselor from another unit was inside of her cabin when something caught her eye in the dense forest. The movement scene was a dim light and it seemed to move further to the end of the camp near the Kiowa unit. It wasn't uncommon for the counselors to be out in the night, especially during the first night of camp. The camp was bursting with life, the girls were excited and the counselors had to settle them down and keep them inside of their tents. Everything seemed to finally settle and the counselors too turned in for the night. Around midnight, however, counselor Carla Wilhite was woken up by the sounds of giggling campers near the bathroom, so she got out of bed and escorted them back to their tent. Then again between 1.30 a.m. and 2, she was woken up again by giggling, but this time coming from tent six. Counselor Carla shined her flashlight over at the tent and told the girls to go to bed, but a warning wasn't enough. She asked Counselor D. Elder to accompany her in order to quiet down the rowdy children. In the dark behind tents one and two, Carla heard a low guttural sound or moan coming from the woods. Thinking it was probably just an animal, Carla went and investigated the noise. She moved her flashlight in the general direction of the sound, but it quickly stopped. She brushed it off and turned to head back to her tent, but as soon as the light was pointed in the opposite direction, the sound started again. So she went back to check, but it stopped. She just returned back to her tent without a second thought. She later recalled how she could still hear the noise once tucked into bed. With everyone tucked away, it seemed odd to the campers in tent 7 when a light quickly approached their door. The light flooded the tent, and one camper noticed through squinted eyes the figure of a man standing in the entryway. The male quickly disappeared back into the darkness, and the camper went back to sleep without a second thought. Meanwhile, another reported hearing screams in the middle of the night, asking for their mom. Counselors would chalk it up to first night jitters. But then, the sun rose. Carla got up early around 6 a.m. to get a shower in before breakfast, and before the campers were up and out of bed. On her walk to the bathrooms, she noticed sleeping bags a little ways away from a tent. It was odd since all of the children were still asleep, but she headed over to investigate. Upon closer examination, it was actually three sleeping bags rather than just one. On top of the open sleeping bag was the body of Denise, while inside the other two were the bodies of Lori and Michelle. The counselor quickly ran for help. The news of the murders spread quickly amongst staff. It was not only shocking, but terrifying. Someone had invaded the camp, and the counselors were none the wiser. The director scrambled on where to turn to next. Everyone else was kept in the dark. When the girls were shuttled back to Tulsa after only one night, the families grew concerned. The only information made available was an accident had occurred, nothing violent. By 10 a.m., the campers were back at home while law enforcement descended upon the camp. Mays County Sheriff Glenn Weaver was assigned to the case alongside the district attorney, Sid Wise. The bodies were found nearly 150 yards from their tent on the side of a trail that ran along the Kiowa unit. The girls were bludgeoned before being strangled to death. The Kiowa unit was positioned furthest to the left of camp, and the view of tent number 8 happened to be obstructed by the bathrooms. This trail near the unit led to the back gate of the camp. It was reported both the main and back gates were locked at 11 p.m., but it wasn't difficult to bypass. There wasn't an actual fence placed around the entire perimeter of the camp, so it was easily accessible. Plus, the camp had no security at night at either gate. Quickly, investigators noticed several pieces of evidence. Duct tape was found on the girls along with the roll it appeared to come from. Near the bodies, rope was also found, alongside a pair of women's eyeglasses with a case and a red flashlight. It was determined that the red flashlight had been altered in a way to reduce light and sound. Tape was placed over the lens to reduce the amount of light, while inside of the flashlight casing were several pages of newspaper. The intent was to prevent the batteries from rattling with movement. The newspaper pages were from Section C, pages 5 through 12 of the Tulsa World, and appeared to be from an issue dated April 17, 1977. 
Inside of the tent, it was nearly impossible to find something without at least a drop of blood on it. The tent flaps, parts of the floor, and the mattresses were the worst. It appeared part of the tent had been broken during the attack. Upon further investigation of the floor, detectives noticed a shoe print embedded in blood. Allegedly, another print was found outside of the tent, but this one was not made from the same shoe. It was theorized that Lori and Michelle more than likely lost their lives inside of the tent, while Denise was either carried or forced to walk to the location where the girls were found. It appeared the assailant tried to clean up spots where the blood had fallen prior to leaving. Near the perimeter of the camp, authorities recovered a crowbar and beer bottles. They believed it to be the murder weapon. Three fingerprints were found on the bodies, but all were partial prints. The search spread beyond the camp and would lead investigators into several nearby locations. More notably, this included caves that sat tucked away in the woods near the camp and a ranch nearby. The Schroff Ranch was around seven miles from Camp Scott and was owned by Jack Schroff. When investigators arrived, Schroff provided an alibi for the date in question. He also added that a week prior to the murders, his ranch had actually been the target of a break-in. The perpetrator didn't steal anything of value, just food, a roll of tape, some beer, and some rope. The rope found at the ranch was very similar to the one found near the girls, indicating their perpetrator may have been the same person. The caves revealed much more. As stated, the caves were not noticeable. Unless you were familiar with the area, you may not know they were even there. Inside one of these caves were the packaging for several food items, newspapers from the same edition of the Tulsa World, two photographs, duct tape matching the one found at the camp, and a message scribbled on the wall that said, quote, the killer was here, bye bye fools, end quote. Someone had been living here for at least a few days. And it was here in the caves that Weaver finally caught a break in the case. The photographs were much more telling. Weaver was able to trace them to a man who developed them while serving time in the Granite Reformatory. His name was Jean Leroy Hart, and he was now their prime suspect. Hart was born on November 27, 1943 in Locust Grove, Oklahoma. Growing up, Hart was a well-known athlete in the small town specifically for football. However, he also became well-known by authorities. From a young age, he started acting out and committing petty offenses. But his first big-time crime was committed in June of 1966. Hart was hanging around outside a Tulsa nightclub when he noticed two pregnant women in the parking lot. He abducted both of the women and drove them out to an isolated spot in Mays County where he assaulted them. He also stole both of their glasses before discarding the women and leaving the scene. Thankfully, both of these women survived the attack. Allegedly, Hart developed poor eyesight and he refused to go to the doctor. He needed glasses so he would steal whoever's he could, hoping to find a match to his failing eyes. Hart was apprehended shortly after, where he was charged with kidnapping and the attack on both women. He was only behind bars for a few months before being paroled. While on parole, he started to break into homes when the owners weren't there. He wasn't caught until his fourth robbery when he broke into the home of a Tulsa police officer. He was arrested again and this time convicted on four counts of burglary. Because he was already on parole, he violated the terms and instead was sentenced to the maximum of 350 years in prison. After only doing a few years of his sentence, Hart managed to escape custody in 1973. While at a hearing at the Mays County Courthouse, he slipped away from guards but was quickly caught and returned to jail. However, upon his return, he escaped a second time and this escape lasted much longer. Weaver compared the known evidence from the camp massacre to Hart and all signs seemed to point in that direction. Law enforcement started an urgent search in order to get him back behind bars. Realizing the type of ground they needed to cover, Sheriff Weaver called upon the help of a group of search dogs from Pennsylvania. It was rumored a local medicine man placed a curse on the dogs stating they would die. It's unclear how or why this came to be, but oddly, two of the dogs would perish. The hunt for Hart was long and exhausting. Authorities contradicted each other when it came to releasing information to the media regarding the case. 
But after 10 long months, Hart was finally arrested. On April 6, 1978, police received a tip from an informant that Hart was hiding out in a residence in Cookson Hills, located 45 miles from the camp. He was taken into custody without issues. That was until the locals caught wind of his arrest. Hart was known around town and oddly had a pretty large support group believing he was innocent. But Sheriff Weaver didn't let that deter him from trying to connect Hart to the murders of the girls. His DNA was recovered and tested even though they only had a partial profile of the perpetrator. This testing could not definitively connect Hart to the scene, but it couldn't rule him out either. Based on this, Weaver charged him with the murders of all three girls. Hart's trial took place in Mays County, a blessing in disguise for Hart. The trial lasted for days and even drew national attention with the courtroom being packed out every day. During trial, new information was revealed. Apparently, the camp had been the target of some threats which included slash tents, burglaries, and a note warning the incoming campers. It was not disclosed by the camp prior to opening for the summer. The defense felt this was enough to prove that there were problems way before Hart or the girls. Prosecution didn't have much to prove his guilt either. All evidence able to connect him was circumstantial evidence and nothing definitive. So, at the end of March 1979, the jury acquitted Hart on all charges related to the girls. He was not a free man, however. He was arrested and this time sent to the state penitentiary in McAllister, Oklahoma to finish out his original 350-year sentence. Hart was only in prison for three months before he died on June 4, 1979 due to a heart attack. Weaver, along with many law enforcement members, believe without a doubt Hart was responsible for these crimes, but what couldn't be proved was another theory of whether he acted alone. In 1996, a private investigator named Ted LaTurner acquired a petition for a grand jury to review leads he turned up. During his time of reviewing the case, Ted claimed he had three potential suspects and a witness, and none of them were Hart. The witness later redacted their statement, and Ted's theory was often discredited by law enforcement. But Ted claimed three men were just as capable of this crime. They included Sonny James, Frank Justice, and Bill Stevens. All of these men had run-ins with the law and were said to have had connections to Hart. Allegedly, on the morning of the murders, Stevens was seen at a cafe near the camp with blood on his boots and he acted very erratically, but nothing ever came of this. He was arrested several months later on charges of assault and kidnapping. Even during Hart's trial, a woman testified that the flashlight found at the scene belonged to Stevens. Stevens' name came up during the trial, but his DNA didn't match, so he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. The same went for the other two, Justice and James. There was nothing to connect them to the crime. Despite the rumors and theories, Hart was the only person to be formally charged in the murders, but it still remains unsolved. Until recently. With technology advancements and decades of work, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation announced in 2022 they are ready to close the case. In 1989, a sample found on Michelle's pillow was submitted to the FBI lab for testing, but due to degradation, a full DNA profile could not be obtained. It was only a partial profile. Hart's known DNA was compared to this partial profile, and he could not be excluded as a suspect. Then in 2019, at the behest of the victim's families, the new sheriff, Mike Reed, submitted the DNA once again. He didn't go public with the results until this year when the families gave him the okay. A full DNA profile still isn't possible, but it doesn't mean it's useless according to Reed. His department took the partial profile and used it to instead eliminate DNA collected from the large number of suspects questioned in this case. Initially, 130 suspects were questioned and over time, DNA was collected from the potentials who could not be ruled out. This latest round of testing eliminated several people who had not been previously. In fact, Reed stated Hart accepted, quote, There's no suspect attached to this case that has not been excluded in one way or another, whether it's DNA, whether it's alibi, whether it's polygraph test, whatever, end quote. 
and this last round couldn't eliminate Hart, whose DNA matched the partial profiles. For Reed, evidence points to Hart, and he remains positive the departments involved will hopefully move forward and officially close out this case. But since it hasn't happened as of yet, he's still open to any information anyone might have pertaining to the case. For the families, their nightmare never ended. For Michelle's father, he joined a group called Compassionate Friends. Compassionate Friends was a support group composed of local parents who also lost their children. Her parents were livid with the way the Girl Scouts handled their daughter's murder. The council never told them what happened to Michelle, and they had to learn the horrific details from the news. Michelle died the day before their wedding anniversary, a day in which they no longer celebrate. Denise's mother reported after her daughter's death, she couldn't go visit the grave since it only reminded her of the pain and suffering her child had to endure. For Lori's parents, it was pretty similar to the other families. Her father was the director of the emergency room at Tulsa's St. John Medical Center at the time. He remembered the day clearly when he got the call. He said, quote, It was from the executive director of the Girl Scouts. I found out later that we were the third people they called. First they called their insurance company, second their attorney, and then they called us, end quote. They too were never given information about how grisly the situation was. Sherry, Lori's mother, became an outspoken advocate for victims, and on what would have been Lori's 16th birthday, she founded the Oklahoma chapter of Parents of Murdered Children. In 1984, the parents of Denise and Lori worked together to sue the Magic Empire Council of Girl Scouts of America. They lost their case and appealed for a second one in 1985, which they lost as well. Camp Scott, the home of many Girl Scouts for over 50 years, never reopened after that day, and it still remains abandoned. As always, another horrific case. I've said it once and I will continue to say it as long as I have this platform, but the children cases are always the worst. I'm just glad it wasn't as detailed as most. I can't imagine that kind of pain sending your child off and entrusting strangers to care for them, as you do, just for them to not come home. It's very tragic. I also don't understand why the camp wasn't held more accountable. Security would have been a good idea, or maybe a fence to prevent creepy crawlies? Maybe? I'm sure things in the 70s weren't as common as they are today, and prior to this, they didn't have any issues. But still, I don't know how comfortable I would feel. I also wonder what the camper to counselor ratio was like. For some reason, I'm getting the vibe they could have been outnumbered. But honestly, to wrap up my ramblings, I'm on the same page as investigators. I think it was hard. But as always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them below and we can chat about it. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're new here, consider subscribing because we would love to have you under the ash tree. I do apologize for being fashionably late this week. I had some stuff come up that needed my immediate attention, and I'm sorry I had to put you guys in the back burner. I also wanted to go ahead and give you a heads up too. Next week, I am having to get a root canal done. Hooray! Um... So I may be a little delayed. I'm hoping to have everything done prior to it because it's not until the end of the week. So hopefully I'll have everything recorded and ready to go before then. But if not, it's just kind of a heads up for you guys. I will try to keep you posted. So shameless plug, if you're not on my socials, go ahead and check those out just to kind of stay in the loop if you want. Those are linked on the channel page and also on the end screen. But as always, my friends, if you made it this far, you are awesome, and I hope you are having an amazing week. Thank you so much for your love and support. I think you're all the best. Until next time, stay safe out there. Bye, friends.